Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. With me today is another legend. I have Rob Condonello. He is a sports podiatrist and owner of Orange Town Podiatry in New York. So, Dr. Rob, how are you doing today? Hey, Tyson. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. And you're also past president of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine, and you're mentioning how many past presidents I've actually had on the podcast. Yeah, I've been really lucky to have mentors like that come before me. And then we've had a few that came after me. So this little club, we kind of get to talk to each other and lean on each other all the time, which is really cool. It's really nice that you were able to put us on there. So after we finish our presidency, we're, we still feel somewhat important. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's the term? Is it only 12 months or is it two years? A 12-month term as president, but you're part of the board and you're on the board for a few years, about five years. So you work your way up and... By the time you're president, and then you become past president, immediate past president, you really don't have much to do. Everyone else before you is doing all the work. You just get older. <laughs> and then you're, then you're sent out to pasture. Out to pasture, yeah. It's good luck. <laughs> well, it is a, it's a good way, though, of keeping it fresh and turning over. I'm part of this group in Cairns called the Business Li Liaison Association. I'm on the board, and we pretty much bring industry and students together, and we try and link them, whether it's in healthcare trades and all these different areas we run a pile of different events through cans throughout the whole year but the person that started it has been the president for the past 30 years you want it to become something that you learn from each other you get some new blood come in teach you some new things and if you don't like it you, you're on your way out which is okay <laughs> yeah but the thing is that the president started the whole thing she's just been there for the last 30 years but it's only now that people are saying there needs to be some form of succession plan where you come in, you work your way through to that position. And at a certain point, you've got to step down, let the next person come in. And I think it brings fresh ideas all the time too. It does. One good thing that's kind of fun is that you do get to meet the people that came before you, but you're also a really a big part of who comes after you. So you can start finding talent. I was lucky enough to be picked by Dr. Doug Ritchie, who I just met casually at meeting a few meetings over the years and he just saw that I had this passion and he, he, he mentioned me to, to be part of it. And we're good friends ever since, which is good. And hopefully I, I could touch someone else's life and bring someone else in over time. Yeah, well, Mike, the most recent past president, Mike Donato, I caught up with him in Chicago in October last year. That was great. He's full of energy. He sure is. He's got that cool accent from Boston too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of, uh, I always find the Boston accent intimidating. Yeah, they got great slang too, like wicked cool and things like that. I have the nasally New Jersey accent, so there's nothing cool about that. <laughs> well, it's almost like their accent is very much, it's a, like a no-nonsense accent. When they talk to you, it's like they mean business. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Which is quite funny. So let's, let's step back a bit. Always interested, what got you into podiatry in the first place? What directed you into this profession? Yeah. So growing up, I always knew I had this tendency of wanting to do something in, in medicine and I had an older cousin who was a dentist and I thought he was cool. And I said, maybe I'll be a dentist. And I remember going to visit, uh, when I got into college, a few dentists and visit him. I'm like, holy man, I don't want to do that at all. That is not for me. And for some people, it wasn't for me. Yeah. So that more along working in, uh, medical clinic at the college and I was a medical technician. I know that was kind of fun. I still didn't know what I wanted to do yet, but clowning around with a few of my friends on the, the residence hall and we were wrestling and wound up breaking my foot and my ankle pretty bad that I needed to get a surgery. And I, I thought it was really neat. And I said, well, the foot and ankle complex is pretty cool. And I've always been an athlete myself. And I thought that was good. So I started looking more into that. And then I was exposed to a doctor, John McNerney, in the tri-state area in New Jersey, and he was the team doctor for, at the time, the New York Giants and the New Jersey Nets and the New Jersey Devils, and he was really kind of the first guy I came across that talked to me about, like, not just what it was, but why, and this is why you get chin splints, this is why you get Achilles tendonitis, not just what it is and how you treat it. So I really like that idea to try to be in like a super sleuth to try to figure things out and try to give people strategies to figure out how to get themselves better and get to their goals. So that was the sort of entry into podiatry itself. Then what directed you more towards the sports side of things? Yeah, like when I, I graduated podiatry school in 1990 
And in the 80s, we were exposed to everything, right? And, and we, we were taught that pretty much at the time that if you wanted to be the elite, you want to get you'd be really good, you have to be a surgical resident. So everyone was striving to be a surgical resident. So I, I got my surgical residency and got trained really well. And, and that's what I was doing. And I did it for so many years, but always had this in my background that I wanted to do more. I yeah. wanted to understand biomechanics a little bit more too. So I kept seeking out people like Doug Ritchie and Rich Blake and, and others like them who understood mechanics a little bit more. I was also always been an athlete myself, ran marathons, triathlons, but I really, I was drawn at one point in time to work with Special Olympics. And the Special Olympics, I started off as just a volunteer. And over time, I kept getting asked to do more because I was willing to do more. And they said, hey, you'd be really good at the, at the state level. You want to do that? I'm like, all right, sure. Hey, you'd be really good at the national level. You want to do that? I'm like, all right. The next thing I know, I was the global clinical advisor for Special Olympics International. And I was going across the world meeting sports medicine practitioners in every country. And what a great opportunity. And what a great opportunity to work with the most pure athletes around. They were just doing mm -hmm. it for the love of the sport and willing to share their issues with us. And that was so cool. I'm still involved with Special Olympics to this day at our state level. But yeah, that was a great opportunity. And along the way, I got to meet people like Simon Barthold in, in Australia and Ivan Bristow in, in England. And just the people you meet, are, it's been so extraordinary. So I just kept moving forward. And then I became the, I got asked by Doug to be on a, a, a sports medicine board. And I remember the first time you're on that board, you have, they, one of the things you have to do is that you have to give a lecture. Like if you give a lecture to the student or, or wherever you went. And I was so nervous. And I, was so nervous. <laughs> and I look back at that now and I still get nervous. I get nervous when I come on even these podcasts sometimes, but I've now given thousands of lectures and and it's it's fun. It's fun. It's, who cares if you make a mistake? You That's know, true. Know, it's not so bad. So I, I think the other thing I also learned about too is that once you get in front of that podium, you're the expert. People look to you. Mm. And I can remember like that first lecture. I mean, I gave it to a bunch of students. I was so nervous after I finished. I said, I have to run to the men's room. And some guy was following me to the urinal. They asked me a question. <laughs> and I, was, uh, I guess I'm the expert now. So I, along the way too, I had the opportunity to go to the Sahara Desert and do the Racing the Planet races in the Sahara. And I had never been camping a day in my life. And here I was camping in the middle of the Sahara, working with experts in sports medicine from many different countries and learning from them. And so it's just given me such a great opportunity to you know, take risks and challenges and do more than expected. So it's been really a fun ride for the last 33 years. What I think is amazing is all the names that you mentioned. <laughs> what I like about that, they've all been on the podcast. Oh, that's cool. So to me, it means, it means, I'm, it means I'm actually getting all the, all the cool podiatrists on here, which is great. And it's quite funny. There's this small group of podiatrists that sort of bag the podcast a little bit who say, we would never go on the Podiatry Legends podcast. It's, it's no good. And I'm like, yeah, no, but all the good podiatrists do come on. So that, <laughs> that is fantastic. Hey, I just want to step back a bit. When you were at university, there was a big surgical aspect to it with your residency. Was there much talk about sports podiatry at the university level, or is it really something that once you finish, you take on that interest yourself? Great question. There was really not much of anything, maybe like a couple of days okay. talking about my peers and, and back then sports podiatry was, was orthotics and people would put it on their card. I'm a sports podiatrist basically because they gave out orthotics. And I was like, that's not sports podiatry. I mean, sports podiatry is so much more, right? But so a lot of it, you really had to get on your own. So as a young doc, I said, all right, I want to learn more. So I said, I'm not going to learn just from podiatrists, but I wanted to learn from physical therapists. If I spent time with them, I wanted to learn from retailers. If I spent time in shoe stores and volunteered my time in shoe stores, I'm just saying what people wanted. I went to athletic training events and I sat to sideline of sporting events. Uh, I would give free screenings whenever I could give free screenings of anything I did know. And over time, you start learning by doing and learning mm. from others. It's been terrific, especially in the world of 
say phys physiotherapy that I, I can talk to talk now with them. I understand what they want because that's kind of what like a lot of physiotherapists want. They want to understand that you understand and appreciate them as well. And, and then you, you form this great team together. So that's been, been terrific as well. Yeah, that was just the feeling I got when I spoke to Mike as well, that at university level, it's not a lot of emphasis is put on that. Whereas in Australia, when we go through, there's a lot of emphasis is on biomechanics and the sporting side of it. So if you have a real interest in that area, it's something you actually come out knowing that's what I want to sort of pursue those interests a, a little bit more but we don't put much emphasis on the surgery side of things. Yeah, it's it's very interesting too. Like when young students come to my practice, they're like, what is this stuff you're doing? I have no idea, they have no idea what I'm doing. It's, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting that they could screw any bone around, but they don't know how to uh, do, do certain things that seem quite simple in, in a day-to-day -day practice. So you're saying at college level, you were an athlete. What's your sport of choice now? Because I notice in the background, I can see an American football helmet. And the Super oh, yeah. Bowl, Super Bowl was only on the other day, and I see a basketball. So, what, what's your sport? What's your favorite sport at the moment? My favorite sport at the moment right now is probably cycling. Yeah, I like cycling. I do like running. I don't do any of it all that well. I'm a, I'm a proud back of the packer. I'm like sixty years old, or soon to be sixty years old. It's trying to do the best you can. But yeah, uh, younger I played uh, lacrosse. I don't know if you know what lacrosse is. Yeah. Um, so I played that. I played soccer. And I wrestled today. I'm like, just trying to stay in the game and do little things to keep me going. So I did my little workout on the Peloton before I got on this, which was fun. <laughs> oh, no, well, it's good to get the blood pumping before you come on here. Out of curiosity, because the Super Bowl was on just the other day, who are we going for? So I was going for Kansas City, not because I'm a Swifty, but... What's uh, a Swifty? Oh, Taylor Swift, because Taylor Swift is... Oh, the okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Went over my head. It was kind of funny. It, I was thinking about it. It's kind of sad, in fact, that we've become this like world or country of spectators watching this sport. And then we became spectators watching a spectator because as spectators, we're watching Taylor Swift to watch the game. And that was like yeah. the whole and like <laughs> I know I saw I was watching a different sport now, but they were talking about the Super Bowl. And they were saying, So what you're thinking when Every now and then when something great was happening with Kansas City, it kept going over to Taylor Swift. And one of the other guys is going, <sighs> I know that's just how we live these days, but I didn't watch the Super Bowl to watch Taylor Swift. And they were getting really frustrated with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people were rooting against Kansas City because of that, because of Taylor Swift. It was, it was good for NFL because it brought, brought a lot of chatter and probably a lot of money. <laughs> 123 million, I think, it was televised. The poor guy that dropped the ball when they did the punt from the 49ers, one job to do, catch the ball. And then he's probably practiced it a thousand times and they've said to him, pretend it's the Super Bowl, the ball's been kicked, all you got to do is step it, catch that ball, run it back, get us in good position, we'll take it from there. And he dropped the ball. And that's what he's going to be remembered for, unfortunately, but... And then they scored straight after that too. They got a touchdown straight from that kick. And I thought, well, you know what? If the 49ers end up winning, which it looked like they were going to at one stage, then everyone would have gone, hey, don't worry about it. The coach would have put his arm around. He said, don't worry about it. Things like that happen, but we still won the Super Bowl. You got a ring. It's great. Oof. I feel so sorry for the poor guy. It was terrible. Anyway, let's get back onto your story, not the Super Bowl. Uh, one of the other things I, you had in your bio, which I thought was interesting, is honorary surgeon for the New York Police Department. Now, there must be some perks on it. Do you get off of parking tickets and all that? You can just do what you want. So how's that, how's that all work? It's not half bad. They, they make you an inspector, so you have rank, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And you have a shield and the whole thing, but I try not to use it too much. Although I, I take care of a lot of the fellows and, and ladies on the force. They're like, you should use that. I'm like, nah, that's okay. So I did use it one time when kids were younger. I wanted to go to the Macy's Day Parade and I got to get up a little closer with them. So I looked like a hero to my kids at the time. But <laughs> I don't use it all that much. So you actually have a badge. You have an official badge that yeah. you can just flash and, and walk into places. How yeah. did that come about? What, what was the, 
What was the story behind actually working your way into that position? Interesting story, and it made me think about today because it was a day where I was in clinic and it was a, a blizzard that day. Just became, it started to snow so bad. We had snow here today, so I thought of it. And I decided, like I send my staff home, I didn't want them to be in danger. So go home, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll be there, I'll close up and take care of things. And then out of nowhere, this guy walks in, limping in, and he's like, hey, are you open? And I'm like, uh, I guess so. What's going on? He goes, I got a problem. So he came on in and showed me his foot and he was in a lot of discomfort. And we fixed him up and he was so appreciative. And he goes, what do I owe you? I said, honestly, I don't even know how to do this stuff. I don't know how to run the front of the office or, or bill you. I said, just come back another time and talk to the staff. And it is what it is. Don't worry about it. He goes, sure? I'm like, yeah, I, I trust you. Whatever it is, I'm glad I could help you. So he comes back like like three days later and he goes, hey, so until I doc, thank you so much. One of this guy was one of the chiefs of police of, NY, of the NYPD. And he goes, I want to put him up to doc to be a police surgeon for the NYPD. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. So went down there and they had to be interviewed and fingerprinted and the whole thing. And I became it, which was pretty interesting. So so just, well, you know, how you know, many years ago was that? That's probably about 14 years ago. Yeah. So I've got a question then about the, because we watch all these TV shows about New York Police Department and they look like this really close knit, tight, almost like family. Is that actually the truth? What it's like behind closed doors? Yeah, it's, it can be a bit gritty to be quite honest too. It's a tough place. It's multi, very diverse yeah. group, but they, they do have this brotherhood and they do like look out for each other and they have to because it's a big place with a lot of bad people out there too. So I want to keep them going. But that was kind of funny, like, not funny, but interesting. Like when COVID was happening and everything was shut down, I was busy because I was still seeing lots of policemen and firemen and uh, and people who had to keep going and help others. So I kept busy doing that. So are you actually doing this for the fire department as well? Not for the fire department, but they're all buddies. So they kind of say, hey, go see this guy. He's not half bad. <laughs> <laughs> No, I remember reading uh, an article written by a psychologist and they were talking about post-traumatic stress disorder with people returning back from military service and they were trying to do all these studies and they mentioned something about in this study, the closest they could come to studying people who hadn't gone overseas to do it yet was the New York Police Department. Oh, yeah, there you go. They said them going out every day when they go out on the street, they don't know what's going to happen. It's not like it's not like being a police officer here in Cairns where I live. Okay. Where, yeah, <laughs> shit can happen, but it's unlikely. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Yeah, there it's a big place, and there's some places that are da more dangerous than others, but they do a great job trying to keep it together. I give them a lot of credit. I wouldn't want the job. Oh. No. No, I wouldn't want it either. So one of the things, prior to jumping on here, I asked you, if was there anything in particular you wanted to talk about? And I like what you wrote down where you said that practitioners, especially young ones, need to learn that you don't need to do it all. What yeah. did you mean by that? Yeah, and I think when we are young doctors, we're taught to do it all. And we should know how to do it all, right? You have to be able to understand all the different things. But as you continue to go on in your career and your practice, you start realizing that if you spread yourself out too much, you're spreading yourself too thin and you're never going to be great at anything. You're going to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. So you really want to be the person who trying to figure out what those what those couple things are, that one thing. There's a book out called The One Thing by a Gary Keller, great book. And he talks about figuring out your one thing. Go oh, right here. Go. There we go. The no. one thing I did a book review on it on the podcast with uh, no my idea. friend Carly O'Donoghue, and a fantastic book. That's really funny, but I love that book. That book kind of struck to me. I didn't really kind of realize this until maybe about five years ago, because I was trying to do it all. I, I was doing surgeries and I was taking care of seniors and wound care and babies <laughs> and sports medicine. And, and everything in between. And you can't be good at everything. I mean, you mm. just can't. And, and I was starting to realize that. And I became very empowered when I realized that it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no to certain things. 
At first, I was a little intimidated by that because the first thing I said no to, and that was probably about three years ago now, is that I was no longer going to do surgery. Even though I was well-trained and I thought I, I did a pretty good job at it, I wasn't going to do it anymore because I, I wanted to focus on the things that really brought me joy and made me happy. And I really enjoyed doing more of the non-surgical things, to be quite honest. I remember that too. Like I, I used to ride a motorcycle and, and then I wound up cracking it up a couple of times. Yeah. And I, didn't, I wasn't riding it. I was only riding it on the weekends or every other weekend. And I started saying, you know what? I'm not getting good at it. If I don't do it all the time, I'm not going to be good at it. So I stopped riding the motorcycle. So you started realizing you got to focus and really find the things that, that you want to do and you have passion for. And that's okay. I think in that, I wrote it down that in that book, he writes, what is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary. What mm -hmm. is the most important thing, right? And it's and, and and for me, it was helping athletes reach their goals. Um, it, and however it is. And sometimes you know, the goals might be surgery. And I decided I'm gonna find someone else who's better at surgery than me and bring that patient there. And I gotta tell you, patients are so appreciative of that. If you can be their quarterback and get them to where they need to be, they really appreciate that. And it gives you returns in, in the long run, which is great. And I also realized I never want to sacrifice my personal life for my work life. And I was starting to do that too much because I was trying to do everything for everyone. So I don't know if you read about my past, but I had some bad medical issues. And I realized that that's the most important thing in life is being there for your family. So yeah, yeah, uh, you'd know Doc Dockery, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and he's funny in the podcast as well. And he had a quote that I usually open up a lot of my talks when I'm doing a presentation. And he always says, yeah, learn like you're going to live forever, but live like you're going to die tomorrow. Absolutely. And it's just so important that you've got to live. You've got to live your life, but learn like you're going to be around for a long time. Yeah. I, I was talking to a sports psychologist the other day, Dr. Rob Gilbert. He has a a podcast that's on every day called Success Hotline. And he was saying that in the niches is the riches. Yeah. So if you find those little things that you're, you like and you're good at, you'll get riches in more ways than one. And, and, mm. it, and I say that all the time. I'm always talking about, I have these five stages that you go through. Once again, it's one of my talks. And I've got a webinar at the moment, and I sort of mentioned this as well, that when we, we're all like students at one stage and then we're graduates, but then at a certain point, step number three, we become what I call a frustrated clinician. And it could happen in the first week or it could happen in your fifth year. But at some stage, you become a frustrated clinician. Step five is having a thriving podiatry career, whether it's your business, employee, doesn't matter what it is. But you will never go from three to five until you become a happy podiatrist. Yeah. And the only way you become a happy podiatrist is to do more of what you love and less of what you don't like. Yeah. And, and so finding your niche is, is part of that love is finding what, like if you really like sports medicine and you can put 80% of your time into that, maybe 20% into other areas, you're going to be a happy camper. That the Pareto philosophy, right? Yes. And I totally believe that. And that's what's so good about like you doing something like this podcast, because first of all, I think it's funny. I look over your shoulder, I see podiatry legends and I'm like, I'm hardly a legend. I'm never in the smartest guy <laughs> in the room. Um, but I think I'm a guy who's learned from time. But you're offering all docs, especially the young docs, mentors, people or who can be coaches, mm. people who made mistakes and learn from those mistakes and uh, kind of giving you like in that shortcut, that highway to get there instead of having to go in that country road all the time to get there. So, you know, I think that's a big part of it too, is that I think the people who know the most who have the most to offer are the ones that are the ones who give it the most. Um, yeah. Guys like Doug Ritchie. I, you know, I didn't know me anything, but I asked him questions. He would always answer his phone. He would always he'd be willing to teach me new things. And I've come along so many different people like that in my life. They're the ones who definitely are the, have the most to give, to give it back. So, yeah. So thank you for what you do and offering this in, a, in an easy way for people to see it. And no, thanks. It's really funny. Only yesterday, I got five emails or messages in one day. It's the most I've ever had in one day of just random podiatrists 
thanking me about the podcast. And some days you have times where you go, oh, does anyone really care about this podcast? Right, no. No, it's good. I mean, it was, I forget what your podcast was on at one time. I was listening to it and I'm like, I got to tell this guy thanks, man, because that's good. I'm glad he's putting it out there. I can't tell you, like, I, I have some great friends who uh, I think the world of, but sometimes all they want to do is complain. They want to <laughs> complain about, uh, this is bad about the job, and this is bad about the profession, and this is going nowhere. I'm like, figure out what you love, man, and, and, and mm. or get out. <laughs> Stop complaining and, and make yourself happy. I think when it's all said and done, and I finally either decide to retire or whatever, I'm going to be really sad when it's over. I'm not going to be glad when it's over. You yeah. know, I, I think that's how it should be. It's like a good movie, right? I, and I feel like it's been a movie for me. You know, all the different things that's happened in my life, the ups and downs. It's I, I want it to keep going. I want it to be season eight, season 10 coming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's latest book. I can't remember the title. When I do the outro on this podcast episode, when I do my final take at the end, I'll tell around the title of Arnie's book. And, but he's saying everything you just said is the part I only read yesterday. And he's just talking about if you're going to do something, just give it your all. Don't give it this half assed attempt. Oh, I'm going to be a podiatrist and just wallow your way through your career. He said, get in there and set the goal that you want to be the greatest podiatrist you, you possibly can be and you give it absolutely everything so at the end of the day you can look back and just go couldn't have given anything more yeah if you know me you know that i have a mantra my mantra is do great things it's on the bottom of everything i write i wear bracelets that say do great things and oh I like that uh, yeah something i've taught my kids and and I think, in, and my kids said to me when they were little, like, what does that mean? Do great things. I said, Whatever you do in life, do it with all your heart, with all your soul. Let people remember who you were. Remember that you were there. I think that's so, so important. So, you know, part of my story is I'm a stage four cancer survivor. And I remember like when I was, had to come home and tell my kids, and I get a little choked up when I tell this story. Yeah. Uh, we, we came home and told the kids, hey, listen, dad's got something bad. I didn't want to tell them at the time that they told me I had 20% survival rate. And, how, how old were they at the time? And they, it was nine years ago. So they were like 13 and 10 and eight. And oh, yeah. we're sitting okay. on the floor and, uh, and I tell them like, look, dad's going to try to get through this. He's a little sick. We're going to figure it out. And, and, and we didn't want to scare him too much. But at one point in time, one, one of my sons just stood up and he put his hand on my shoulder. I said, it's, uh, it's time to do great things. And I was like, holy cow, you've been listening. So that's cool. It was really cool. It's, to me, you know, like I say things, it's like a movie. It reminds me of like when, when in Rocky, when Adrian says win, when he wakes up and, and when she was sick. And I was like, yeah, win. So I knew at that time it was my time to do great things and, and, and learn about like life is about others and, and gratitude and to keep on going, like no matter what it takes. So you're right. Instead of complaining about things, learn from it, embrace it enjoy it and, and go from there so no yeah. and, and so you, and you're totally clear now everything's good yeah i'm totally good i have nothing to complain about life is good so we're going to keep on moving forward i don't even think about it anymore anyway, sometimes i wonder if it was even me it seems like yeah. it was like a some, well, someone else that it happened to but i just think it's such a positive way to to look at things to do great things because like you said i know a lot of podiatrists that are good podiatrists and but some of them are negative they just yes. When they open the mouth, it's just ugh, nothing. You don't feel good after yeah. hanging around them. And it's funny that podiatry in different countries have a different sort of attitude as well. Like I always find podiatrists in America really uplifting. I don't know if it's just the ones that I've associated with, but I always find them extremely uplifting. Yeah, I mean, well, you got to hang out with some of the ones I know because they're not all like that. But <laughs> I don't want to hang around them. <laughs> they could, they could bring you down. But I actually told some of them. I said, listen, if we're gonna do this every every day, we're gonna we're not gonna be able to be friends anymore I mean, for a while. We can't talk because I yeah. said I, I want negativity out of my life now too because I want to move forward and, and and find the things that gave you joy and passion and go from there. Yeah, uh, I think it's really put like when I was in the states last year, I caught up with uh, Patrick McKinney. And he's been on the podcast uh, a number of times in Remy Statkus and Pete Lovato. 
this. So I caught up with them all in Chicago and we went to the Chicago Bears game. Oh, and yeah. these guys are just so good to be around. Yeah. You spend just a couple of hours with them and you walk away just going, oh, the profession needs to, everyone needs to be like that. Just have this really positive attitude towards what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of like you, you mentioned before about the American Academy of Sports Medicine. That's kind of like a, a lot of the people in that are, are real positive. And that's, and that's why I enjoy being part of that as well. And you got here, you said that when we're talking about a younger podiatrist, you know, they don't need to do everything. You said focus on three things that brings you satisfaction. What, any three things, or do you have three suggestions that you reckon they should focus on? Or they're just going to find their niche and then three things within that niche that they really want to do more, or learn more about? Yeah, it's kind of like that 80 20 rule, right? 80 20. And 20% of the stuff is what brings you the joy. And then you can zone back into a little bit more. What's 20% of the 20%. So for me, you know, I like doing regenerative medicine. We do a lot with shockwave therapy. I find it to be great with my athletes because it winds up not being therapy, but a cure. That's been terrific. I also started to work doing utilizing microwave energy to take care of HPV lesions. And I was like fortunate enough to write the first U.S paper on that. That's been a lot of fun. And, and I like working with the, with, with special populations. So with the special Olympics and all, so those things together have been really great for me. That, that those are my three things. It's just been a good ride. It's been a great ride. If you find those things that, that bring you joy, it's going to make you have a happier day. And, and listen, I have some bad days too, but you know, kind of focus on the positives. Oh, no, but no, I used to tell, say that to Padarish as well. Like, my clinic was focused on sports, biomechanics, and orthotics. And I'd say, I used to say about 80% of our time was all spent on that and 20% was just routine foot care. Mm -hmm. And then when I looked at the figures deeper and I found it was actually 70-30. Uh -huh. But another clinic that we'd set up in Mackay about 500 miles away, 800 kilometres, it was just 100% sports, biomechanics, orthotics. We didn't even have any instruments. So therefore, we couldn't do any routine foot care. Yes. And that was a great place to work, but it still didn't mean you didn't have patients that tested. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, tested your attitude sometimes. Like we, we don't do as much routine foot care anymore here in the practice. And this woman came in the other day and she was like this tough lady from the Bronx. And she's like, hey, cut my toenails. You know, went to act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't do that, ma'am. I'm sorry. She goes, well, what do you do? And I was like, wow. I said, well, if you have to ask that, you shouldn't be here. You're in the wrong place. But I wound up cutting her toenails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she like, scared you yeah, to do it. Scared, <laughs> yeah. But I said, listen, we don't do this anymore. I could recommend someone else who could do a better job than I can do. But you know, the funny thing was, is that she goes, well, tell me what you do. She was like, kind of tough. And I told her what I do. And I say, we do a lot of this regenerative medicine to take care of overuse injuries. And she goes, I play pickleball. And she goes, my Achilles is killing me. Will you do that shockwave therapy for me? I was like, absolutely. So I cut her toenails, but she's now a shockwave patient. So sometimes just explaining what you do to people. And next thing you know, you got a patient. That's what I've noticed in 33 years. It's all about building relationships, right? Mm, definitely. Relationships are built on communication and trust. So once you explain to them the things that you do and why you do them and why you're passionate about them, they'll trust you. I think patients care less about what you know, but how much you care about them. And, and if you show that you really care about getting them to where they want to be, they'll, they'll, they'll sign in for you. Sign up for no, you I agree 100%. Agree and that's something that I tell people who may have a, a clinic that where they might be working somewhere and it's predominantly routine foot care. It's just the job they've taken and they may not be enjoying it. But I said, all you gotta do is ask every routine patient that sits in front of you out of curiosity, what do you feel like when you get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. So just that one simple question will open up the conversation of you'll be surprised how many of them tell you, Oh, my feet freaking kill me in the morning. Yeah. And then that's a conversation where you can go, Oh, did you know? And you can start educating them. Once you educate them, I said, you'll be booking them back in for other types of treatment, not just routine foot care. It's such a simple question. Yeah, that, that that's a great question. And, and how I start every patient that comes in to see me, I always tell them, tell me your story. 
because everyone's got a story and everyone wants to tell you their story. Yeah. And once they start, and don't interrupt them. Don't interrupt them until they stop talking. Sometimes it can go a little bit too long, but once they stop, <laughs> that's when you find your place. And I noticed that with like a lot of the young practitioners and clinicians, they're too quick to get to where they want to be. They'll read on the form, reason for visit, oh, plantar fasciitis. How long have you had plantar fasciitis? How do you know she has plantar fasciitis? Because she figured that out from WebMD. Talk to her. Maybe she has a stress fracture. Maybe she has something different. Don't just assume. So let them tell their story so you could develop that relationship. Yeah, that's really good advice. I remember the, the head of the podiatry department when I went through in a QUT in Brisbane, Alan Crawford, we should just call him Crackers. And he, <laughs> he, I don't think he listens to the show. And, but I remember him saying, if you ask the patient enough questions, they will tell you everything you need to know. He says, do not dive in with your assumptions too early or you're gonna, you're gonna miss so much and you'll make a bad diagnosis. And that was Absolutely. something that just stuck in my head Probably he had probably slapped me a few times, telling me, reminding me. But that was one thing that stuck in my head when I graduated that ask really good questions. Just keep asking really good questions and let them talk. Yeah. And you get all the answers. Yeah. I mean, I, I, at a personal level, I can tell you how it had affected me. Before I had my throat cancer, my stage four throat cancer. I was diagnosed with something called glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which was an issue with the ninth cranial nerve. And I went to my the neuro, neurosurgeon and he said, you need surgery. So we did, they did brain surgery on me a year and a half beforehand. And, and I never really got much better. I got a little better, but not great. And I kept going back to him and telling him, hey, I don't feel right. And he wasn't, he kept saying, I think everything's fine. Maybe you got to go somewhere else. So I, I kept going to different docs. And the long and short of it was that he, he missed the diagnosis. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there's a book right here that I keep back there called Cognitive Dominance. He wrote that book and he came to me and he said, hey, I want to write a book. And it became a New York Times bestseller. And I put your story in it. And he goes, but I want to ask you one other thing. I go, what? He goes, I want to ask you for your forgiveness because I did unneeded brain surgery on you. At the time we were having dinner and I said, well, that's kind of heavy over appetizers. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, what did you, what did you learn from it? And he learned that he said, don't let the patient lead you to where it have to be. And think of the 10 other things it could be. Look for the zebras, right? When you hear the hooves. Yeah. And, and it's such an important piece that I'll never forget that. And, and you know what? Even though it was a, a crappy thing to have to go through, it was probably one of the most important things that happened in my life because it made me see things in a different way as well. But it is, it's one of those things, I always say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. But sometimes there can be some real adversity in people's lives and you can either choose to use it as a positive. Yeah, totally. Or you can use it and go, poor me, life is unfair. And I just accepted really early. My mum told me this, life is unfair. Suck yeah. it up. And just move on, just get on with it. It's just the way it is. She told me this when I was about 10. Life is unfair. The earlier you work that out, then you'll just move through it. Don't wallow in your misery. Yes. Yeah. What, what Tom Hopkins, he, his quote is, I'm not judged by the number of times I fail, but by the number of times I succeed. And then the number of times I succeed is in direct proportion to the number of times I fail and keep on trying. So yeah. you got to make mistakes, but you're not judged by them. You're judged by how you learn from those mistakes. Yeah, that's from the Rocky movie too. It doesn't matter how many times you get hit, it's how many times you get back up. Yeah, that's right. But you got to yeah. do it with the Sylvester Stallone accent. I mean, yeah, I can't do that. I have seen the, I have seen the Sylvester. I got. I went to Philadelphia. I ran up the steps, did the usual thing, yeah, and the music going in your head. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> but it's funny how you said, like on that bracelet, you got do great things. And it was the same as like the necklace that I have around my neck all the time. I had it for, I can't remember how long I've had it for. But one of the things I was always going to get engraved on it was just the number one. Okay. It was always something I was going to do. So now after this, I'm going to go and make sure I do it. And the reason I wanted number one there was because every time I look at this thing, because I, I keep imaging, uh, visualizing that there was a one on there, is every time I did anything or no matter what I did, I always wanted to be number one. Ah, there you go. And I wanted to get engraved backwards. So when I see it in the mirror, I actually see the one. It wasn't for everybody else. It was for me. 
but everything I've ever done didn't matter whether I played whether I was playing rugby league or rugby union or doing athletics, volleyball, it didn't matter what my goal was to be now more didn't mean always was, but that was always my goal. To just oh, yeah. pu- push myself to be the best that I can. Doesn't mean you always will be, but if you don't push for it, you're not gonna get there. Yeah, I think there should be like a war against average. Oh I mean, yeah. Everyone- Everyone wants to be just average. I, I don't want to be average. I want to do more than expected. I want to be remembered. I want to be an innovator. I, I, I think about like, who's the, the most innovative athlete of all time? And you might say, I don't know, it's Michael Jordan or it's na- name whoever you want to name. Yeah. To me, Dick Fosbury. You know who Dick Fosbury was? No. Dick Fosbury was the guy who came up with the Fosbury flop. Oh, okay. Jump. Yeah. Yep. And before his time, he was an engineering student. He decided, let me go backwards, change my center of gravity, and I could go higher and, and, and change it. Since he won the, the Olympics in 1968, no one's ever done it any other way but that. So he was yeah. an innovator. He made a difference. He left his mark. He did great things. I want to do great things, whatever it's going to be. I don't know what it is yet, but I keep trying. <laughs> I've really enjoy- enjoyed this conversation today. It's got me, me all, yeah. all pumped up. And anyone who's listening to this, if you are not fired up right now after getting to this point in the podcast, you need to give yourself an uppercut, go and take two Panadol and a lie down and then come back and listen to it again because you've obviously missed something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's, there's so much good out there. We just got to go find it and we have to you know, find it in others. And that's the key. And I think that's what you're doing. You bring it out in others and you want you. You help us tell stories, right? I think everyone I've listened to on on your podcast, it's it's about storytelling, mm. and sto- stories are told in the in the present about the past, and hopefully remember them in the future. So I thank you for what you do. It's been great. You know, Rob, this has been absolutely fantastic, and and I always say sometimes I feel really selfish when I do the podcast because I get to do the interview live with you. Then I get to go back and I get to listen to it a second time when I'm doing the edit. And then a lot of times I'll listen to it again in the car just after I've done the editing and I've released it just to make sure I haven't stuffed something up, which I have done in the past. And so I feel really selfish that I get so much out of it myself. And and when you said before about, yeah, you don't want to be average. I think there's there's enough average podiatrists out there. We don't need any more. We don't need more. Yeah, Yeah. everyone needs to just be better. Just be better than what they are. Do great things. Okay. And I say, when you come to the States next time, you come to New York, we're going to get tattoos. You're going to get a number one and I'm going to get two great things. I have no tattoos. However, <laughs> I always said, one day I'm going to get one. I just can't find out what to get. So maybe they think, well, actually, we're going to be in New York City, December 2025. That's the plan. All right. Excellent. So we're going to work our way. Uh, we'll work our <laughs> way over there and then, and then back to Philly for Christmas. So it should be fun. Beautiful. Okay, Rob, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast, sharing your wisdom, your inspiration, sharing the whole do great things. This has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.